we have wrapped ourselves in a bubble of technological marvels. Our homes are monuments to modernity, filled with smart thermostats, multi-layered insulation, and furnaces controlled by computers. We trust this technology. We depend on it. And every single winter, it fails us. Your home, with its R30 insulation and double-paned windows, is an expensive, fragile trap. When a real cold snap hits, the power grid gives out, the furnace goes silent, and suddenly your fortress of comfort is little more than a decorative icebox. We huddle under blankets, watching our breath plume in our own living rooms, feeling a profound and terrifying vulnerability. But in the dead of the world's worst winter, during the brutal campaigns of World War II, soldiers faced temperatures of 30 degrees, sometimes even 40 degrees. They lived in holes scraped out of the frozen earth with little more than uniforms on their backs. Their secret to survival wasn't a roaring fire or a high-tech furnace. It was the ground beneath their feet. How did they turn frozen earth into a radiator? They used a forgotten piece of engineering so effective, it seems to defy modern logic. And today, we're digging up that secret. Before we descend into the frozen trenches of the past, type General Winter in the comments if you believe our modern comforts have made us fragile. I want to know, does this resonate with you? Drop that comment now. Number one, the anatomy of a modern failure. To truly comprehend why the simple bunker succeeded, we must first dissect why the complex modern home fails so catastrophically in a grid-down scenario. Your house is most likely a stick-frame construction. A skeleton of wooden 2x4s is covered with plywood sheathing and finished with drywall. This system is brilliantly designed for speed and cost-effectiveness. But it is engineered for one thing and one thing only, to work in tandem with a furnace that is constantly producing new heat. The furnace aggressively pumps heat in. The insulation tucked between the studs simply slows its inevitable escape. But the moment the power is cut, the heat source is gone. The furnace falls silent. Your home instantly transforms from a shelter into a container of rapidly cooling air. Heat pours out through every weak point, the large, beautiful windows, the tiny cracks around doors and fixtures, and it conducts directly through the wooden studs in your walls, which act as thermal bridges to the outside. The system is designed to be active, not passive. Without its power source, it has no inherent ability to retain warmth. Number two, the illusion of modern insulation. We've been taught to value our value, a measure of an insulation's resistance to heat flow. And modern fiberglass or foam insulation has a very high R value. But this metric is dangerously incomplete. It only tells you how slowly heat will pass through a material, not how much heat that material can hold. This brings us to the concept we've utterly neglected, thermal mass. Thermal mass is a material's ability to absorb, store, and then slowly radiate heat. A dense granite boulder, after sitting in the sun all day, will remain warm long after sunset. It has incredibly high thermal mass. A tin shed, by contrast, is scorching in the sun and freezing the moment a cloud passes over. It has almost no thermal mass. Your modern home, for all its technical sophistication, is a well-insulated tin shed. Drywall, wood, fiberglass, and air have virtually zero thermal mass. They cannot store heat energy. In our race for lightweight, fast, and cheap construction, we have engineered away the heavy, dense, heat-storing materials of the past. We traded the thermal battery of mass for the supposed efficiency of a sealed box that is completely dependent on the grid. It's a fragile system where, if one link breaks, the entire chain of survival fails. The house has no thermal inertia, no stored energy to fight back against the encroaching cold. Number three, the frozen hellscape. 
the soldiers of World War II could not afford such a fragile system. Their survival depended on inverting this entire philosophy. To understand their solutions, we have to understand the hell that made them necessary. This was not a camping trip with high-tech gear. This was a war fought against two relentless enemies, the opposing army and the environment itself. During the Battle of the Bulge in the brutal winter of, of 1944-1945, temperatures consistently dropped to 20 degree four, feeling like 30 degrees for colder with the wind chill. On the Eastern Front, conditions were even more apocalyptic, with temperatures plummeting below 40 degrees, the point where Fahrenheit and Celsius scales meet. This was a cold that attacked everything and everyone. It turned the lubricating oil in weapons and vehicles to sludge. Steel became brittle and could shatter like glass. Wet clothes froze solid, becoming suits of ice. Frostbite and exposure claimed thousands of casualties. In the Ardennes Forest, over 15,000 American soldiers were treated for cold injuries alone. In many cases, more soldiers were lost to the weather than to enemy fire. The environment itself became a weapon of mass casualty. Number four, the psychological war of cold. This constant penetrating cold waged a second war on the minds of the soldiers. It was a relentless psychological aggressor. The cold robbed them of sleep, dulled their senses, and slowed their thoughts. Every moment was spent in a state of physical misery that eroded morale faster than enemy propaganda ever could. The simple act of reloading a rifle became an agonizing task for numb fingers. The will to fight, to stay vigilant, to simply go on, was under constant assault. On a battlefield, fire is often a death sentence. A wisp of smoke from a poorly managed fire was a painted target for enemy mortars. The faint glow of a flame at night was an open invitation to a sniper. The choice was stark and cruel. To stay warm was to risk instant, violent death. To stay hidden was to risk a slow, agonizing death from exposure. Survival demanded a solution that solved both problems at once. A way to find warmth that was both effective and invisible. This was the crucible in which their ingenuity was forged. Number five, harnessing a planet-sized radiator. The standard issue gear was tragically inadequate for these conditions. Many soldiers lacked proper winter coats or insulated boots, having been told to pack light for a fast advance that quickly bogged down into a static, frozen war. They had to look at their surroundings, not as a hostile landscape, but as a collection of untapped resources. Their salvation lay in rediscovering a principle as old as life itself. They had to go underground, not just to escape the shells, but to tap into the single greatest source of warmth available to them, the planet itself. And the first principle that saved them was this profound rediscovery, the power of the Earth. Just a few feet below the frost line, the ground maintains a remarkably stable temperature, typically between 55 to 5 degree high year-round. This is the secret of caves, which feel cool in summer and warm in winter. By digging into the earth, soldiers learn to tap into this massive planetary scale thermal reservoir. Number six, the Zemlyanka. This realization led to the widespread use of dugouts, known as Zemlyankas on the Eastern Front. These weren't just crude holes in the ground, they were sophisticated thermal structures. Digging eight to 10 feet deep put a massive insulating blanket of earth between the soldiers and the deadly sub-zero air outside. The bunker's interior temperature was naturally and passively pulled toward the stable 50 degree temperature of the deep earth. Instead of fighting a 100 degree battle from 30 degree up to a livable temperature, their baseline was already above freezing. The battle for warmth was half won before it even began. This demonstrates the concept of a thermal flywheel. The sheer tonnage of soil and rock surrounding a bunker acts as a massive battery for heat. 
It resists rapid changes in temperature. It absorbs any excess heat generated inside, from body heat, a single candle, or a small stove, and then radiates it back slowly and evenly over many hours. While a tent would go cold the instant a heat source was removed, the earth-sheltered bunker would hold its warmth for hours, sometimes even days. The construction was a masterclass in using available materials. Roofs were not just dirt piled on logs, they were layered systems. A timber frame would be covered with a thick packed layer of wet clay, then several feet of excavated earth, and finally the original turf was carefully replaced for camouflage. The dense clay acted as a heat storing air barrier. Some advanced designs on the Eastern Front even featured a double roof system, trapping a pocket of air that acted as a phenomenal insulator, a primitive double pane window on a massive scale. German engineers even had a term for this kind of design, vermifalle, or heat trap. Number seven, field expedient stoves. With the bunker itself acting as a passive thermal battery, the next challenge was to actively charge it with heat. This is where the raw ingenuity of the field expedient stove comes in. The design constraints were absolute, scarce fuel, and the paramount need for stealth. The most common solution was the oil drum stove. Empty 55-gallon drums were plentiful on any mechanized battlefield. Soldiers would cut a hole for fuel and another for air intake. But the real genius lay in their subtle optimizations. The bottom of the drum was often filled with a thick layer of sand or gravel. This created an internal thermal mass, absorbing the intense heat of the fire and radiating it out more slowly and evenly. The inner walls were frequently lined with a layer of wet clay, which acted as a primitive refractory. This insulated the metal, preventing it from glowing red hot, a deadly giveaway at night, and helped radiate heat more gently. The critical problem of smoke remained. This led to the widespread use of the hidden chimney trick, a principle modern survivalists know as a Dakota fire hole. Instead of venting the stovepipe straight up, they would route it horizontally through a long, shallow trench, sometimes for dozens of feet. As the hot smoke traveled through this buried pipe, its immense heat was transferred directly into the surrounding earth, creating a primitive but effective form of underfloor radiant heating. By the time the exhaust gas finally emerged, often far from the bunker and hidden under a bush or in a ditch, it had cooled considerably. Cool smoke is denser and hugs the ground, dissipating like a low mist instead of rising in a telltale column. Number eight, insulating with fat and sand. A damp bunker is a cold bunker. Water leaches heat from the body 25 times faster than dry air. But earth and concrete are porous. Moisture is a constant enemy. The soldiers needed an airtight, waterproof sealant, and they certainly couldn't go to a hardware store. So they invented their own. The solution was a bizarre and likely foul-smelling, yet brilliantly effective, mixture. Sand mixed with rendered animal fat or scavenged grease from disabled vehicles. This disgusting concoction was a primitive, field-made waterproofing putty. Fat from rations or scavenged animal carcasses was rendered down and mixed with fine sand, creating a dense, pliable, and hydrophobic paste. This grease sand was smeared by hand into every crack, seam, and joint in the bunker's construction. Its function was threefold. First, it was a phenomenal water repellent, preventing dampness from seeping through the walls and roof. This was critical not just for warmth, but for health, helping to prevent trench foot and other moisture-related ailments. A dry shelter was a healthy shelter. Second, it was a perfect airtight sealant. Unlike clay, which could dry and crack, this greasy mixture stayed pliable in the cold. It eliminated drafts, putting the soldiers in full command of the bunker's ventilation. Finally, and most importantly, it protected the primary insulator, the earth itself, 
wet soil transfers cold far more efficiently than dry soil. This disgusting but effective plaster protected the thermal integrity of the entire structure. Of number nine, the bunker as a complete system. The true genius of the wartime bunker was not in any single element, but in how all the elements worked together as a complete synergistic system. It was a holistic design born of necessity. They had used the earth for thermal mass, scrap metal for a high efficiency heat engine, battlefield refuse for a sealant, and tactical cunning to hide the evidence. The earth shelter design provided a high temperature baseline doing half the work passively. The field expedient stove with its own internal thermal mass and radiant clay liner efficiently charged the space with active heat. The hidden chimney trick not only concealed the smoke, but also recaptured its waste heat, using it to warm the floor. And the grotesque fat and sand sealant made the entire structure airtight and waterproof, ensuring the heat that was generated and stored stayed inside. This wasn't just a shelter, it was a living machine designed in perfect harmony with its environment. Number 10, legacy and modern relevance. The story of these bunkers is a profound and humbling lesson in resilience. When we juxtapose their simple robustness with the high-tech fragility of a modern home in a power outage, the conclusion is unavoidable. In our relentless quest for convenience, we have engineered away our own resilience. The soldiers in those frozen foxholes possessed knowledge. They understood that the earth is a thermal battery. They knew that dense materials store heat. They knew how to control airflow for efficient, smokeless combustion. They knew how to make a waterproof seal from waste. These principles of physics haven't changed. They are timeless. Today, these forgotten methods are being reborn in the worlds of sustainable architecture and off-grid living. The concept of using the Earth's stable temperature is the entire foundation of modern Earth-sheltered homes, which require minimal heating and cooling. The rocket mass heater, a modern, super-efficient stove, uses the exact same principles as the hidden chimney trick a hyper-insulated vertical combustion chamber, and a long horizontal flue that snakes through a thermal mass bench or floor, transferring nearly all the fire's heat into the living space before exiting. This is precisely what soldiers were building with clay, scrap pipe, and dirt 80 years ago. What they accomplished out of desperation predated the modern sustainability movement by half a century. In the end, the survivable warmth of a World War II bunker wasn't a miracle or an accident. It was applied science under the most extreme pressure imaginable. It stands as definitive proof that a few basic laws of physics, correctly applied with ingenuity, can be far more powerful and reliable than our most advanced furnace when the grid fails. The bunkers stayed livable because they were designed in harmony with their environment, not in opposition to it. They stored energy in their mass, they controlled their airflow with precision, and they sealed themselves from the elements using what was available. They survived not because of what they had, but because of what they knew. The enduring lesson is a stark one. We may have gained unprecedented efficiency and convenience, but we lost durability and fundamental knowledge. And perhaps, in our pursuit of a comfortable and effortless life, we lost something more profound, a connection to the materials we use and the essential skills required to make them truly last.